Hello everyone, I'm Dovle and in this video I'll be talking about the different types of winds and how they affect aviation. So let's get started. So teaching point one will be talking about surface winds. So as you all know, winds play a major factor in flight planning, right? I mean, w the pilots should be aware of the direction and magnitude of the wind, especially when they're close to the ground. Okay, so whenever they're close to the ground, the first type of wind they will be affected by is surface friction, okay? This plays an important role when it comes to takeoff and landings, okay? So what is surface friction? It's basically uh, friction from uh, with the air and the ground that causes a low wind speed, okay? So this affects about from zero feet, so like from the ground, all the way up to 3,000 feet, okay? So this will cause the wind to blow across the isobars and toward the center of a low pressure area and away from high pressure areas, okay? So there's two main key things here, right? Across the isobars. So isobars, in case you don't know, is when you look at the like wind maps, is the lines on the map, those are called isobars and they blow across the isobars, okay? And uh, it goes towards the uh, cent center of a low pressure area. So this one, I memorize it by thinking, just like students, they, just like just normal people in general, they don't like high pressure. So they run away from high pressure and they run towards low pressure, okay? So that's how I remember how winds go work. And above 3,000 feet, uh, surface friction is no longer a factor, and the winds blow parallel to the isobars, okay? So if the isobars are like this, the winds will also blow in this direction. So the speed of the winds will be proportional to the pressure in that specific area. And these, uh, obviously, these surface friction only apply when on relatively flat ground. But what about mountainous areas? Well, for mountainous areas, there are two types, uh, three types of winds actually, but there is a pair of them called anabatic and catabatic winds. So the first is anabatic winds. So this is basically when it is in the day, so it's in the morning, there's sun right there, and the slope of the hill is warmed, this surface is warmed, and the air is warmed around it. The air around it is warmed and it gets less dense, and then it will rise up the slope creating clouds okay so this is anabatic winds and for catabatic winds it's basically exactly the different uh, exactly the opposite thing it happens at night and the hill is cooled by radiation because like you know just things cool in general and when the uh, surface is cooled the air around it is also cooled and it gets more dense and it just flows down the slope so a good way to remember this is there's a story that my instructors used to tell me. It's basically, is a kind of like a short story. Is that like Anna, a, a person named Anna. Anna walks up the hill and pushes down the cat. It's kind of morbid, but the point is, Anna is the one that goes up the hill, and the cat is the one that goes down the hill. Okay, so Anna goes up the hill and throws the cat down. Pretty self-explanatory how these work. So other than anabatic and catabatic winds, there is also mountain waves, okay? So mountain waves are basically, uh, so there's two parts to mountain waves. This is a diagram of how mountain waves work. So you can see this part is going up the slope. Up slope is smooth air. And when they go over the top of the slope, it starts to get really bad, right? There's eddies over here and there's some turbulence over here as well. So the effects of mountain waves, okay? So, there will be common, common downdrafts of 2,000 feet per minute along the downward slope. Okay, so these eddies here, they'll be pushing your aircraft downwards, which is pretty dangerous, so you don't want to be flying in those areas. There will also be extreme turbulence in the air layer between the ground and the top of the rotor clouds. Okay, so rotor clouds are these things here. So there will be extreme turbulence in this area. So again, you want to be avoiding these as, as much as you can because they are pretty bad for your aircraft. There's also even more things. There's severe wind shear due to wind speed variation between the different parts of the wave. So you look at this diagram, it's just 2D, right? But when you think about a 3D diagram, like the mountain is not going to be like this as uh, on all sides of the mountain. There will be 
uh, shorter sides, there will be taller sides. So the waves will uh, act in a different way as well. They're not just all straight lines or parallel like. So the different parts of the wave will have different speed wind speeds, which will create wind shear. And finally, there will also be altimeter errors. Okay, so there could be potentially more than 3,000 feet of difference from the, your actual altitude and the altimeter's reading. Okay, this is caused by wind speed increase because there's just so much wind around you and also the pressure decreasing will also negatively impact how the altimeter actually reads, right? So these are the effects of a mountain waves and it's actually pretty dangerous when you think about them. Uh, next up is gusts. Okay, so gusts are basically rapid and irregular changes of wind speed, okay? And in some situations, direction may also vary, but that is not exactly a necessity for gusts. And it is caused by two things, either mechanical turbulence, which is friction between the air and the ground, or it is caused by unequal heating on the, of the ground. And this is uh, most common during hot summer days, so these are the times that gusts are more, most likely to happen. Finally, you also got squalls. Squalls are basically a sudden increase in strength of wind. They're basically, to put it really simply, they're basically longer versions and stronger versions of gust. Okay, gust does not last that long, but squalls can last for hours. And uh, they may change directions as well, just like a gust. And they are caused by a passing moving cold front or a thunderstorm, okay? So basically, again, these are also things you might want to be avoiding for your safety. So that's teaching point one. Next up in teaching point two, describe jet streams, okay? so. Jet streams are basically, it looks like this, they are narrow bands of exceedingly high speed winds, okay? So they can go from 100 to 150 knots in general, but there have been recorded 250 knots wind in these uh, air jet streams, okay? So they're like very, very strong winds. And they're usually located, they are located at higher levels of the atmosphere so between two uh, 20,000 to 40,000 feet and they go from west to east okay so in the northern hemisphere it goes like this like these are the two main jet streams in the northern hemisphere they are 300 nautical miles wide okay so they're I mean they're wide in terms of like an aircraft but they're not very wide when it comes to when you think of the actual atmosphere this is they're not very wide things but 300 nautical miles wide, so all like if you want to t uh, fly an aircraft at high altitudes, you might want to take these because they can help you. They are key to planning long range flights at high altitude because they can really help you uh, use less fuel while flying, uh, flying fast, faster. However, if you're flying the other way, so if you're flying from east to west, then you really want to avoid these because that is going to be very strong headwinds. So it's very key to planning long range flights. And finally, the last thing we'll be talking about in this video is clear air turbulences, okay, cats. So clear air turbulence are basically bumpy and turbulent conditions in a cloudless sky, okay? So when the sky is cloudless, that does not necessarily mean there's no dangers. Um, they usually start at 15,000 feet, but when it gets to 30,000 feet, that will be really severe clear air turbulence. And they are most likely to be just above the central core of a jet stream. So unfortunately, these are in almost impossible to forecast and they can be a hazard uh, to the aircraft if it is severe enough. So in general, it is advised that pilots should just try to avoid flying in areas where cats are most likely to occur. Okay, so these are basically just like the central core of a jet stream. Try avoiding flying in those areas because those are the areas that is most likely to have cats and cats are bad for aircrafts and that is the end of the video if you enjoyed this video remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel and if you have anything else you want to learn about aviation wise you can leave a comment on my video and i will try to make another video about it i hope you enjoyed this video and i'll see you in the next video